been while I run this race. Lord, guide my feet while I run this race. Lord, guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Race in vain. Hold my hand while I run this race. 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 Search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race. Search my heart while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Race in vain. This morning, on the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany, we join our hearts together to worship Almighty God and prepare ourselves for the opportunities of this coming week. Again, we are grateful for the technology that allows us to continue to worship together even though we are separated from one another. We can continue to find ways to encourage and support one another as a family of faith. And again, I want to thank you for your faithful and regular financial support of our congregation. Thank you. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds to experience God's presence as we worship Him this morning. call to worship comes from Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth below. Come to me, my faithful ones. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. Would you bow with me for a moment of silence and our invocation? Almighty God, creator and sustainer of all, we worship you as our God, our Savior, the one that we follow. This morning, we are filled with praise as we remember the stories of Scripture. We marvel at the way that you have revealed yourself in ages past. We are encouraged as we watch the ways you have tenderly dealt with your people. And we remember not only the stories of sacred Scripture, we recall the ways that you have dealt with us, saving, forgiving, nurturing, encouraging us. We acknowledge that we are not yet all that you want us to be. We know that there is much to learn and much to do. We believe that you have called us to service. We believe that you want us to grow and mature in our faith. And so we move forward knowing that the future is unknown. We know that challenges lie ahead. We also know that opportunities are there as well. We don't ask that the future will be easy. 
but we do ask for your continued presence. We don't expect to be perfect, but we do want to be faithful. We don't expect answers to all of our questions, but we do pledge to keep looking. This morning, for these few moments, we set aside our fears, our doubts, our uncertain future, and for these few moments, we worship. We bow down. We acknowledge you as our Lord and our God. Accept our worship and bless our service. Amen. The Gospel reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. learning new things. How about you? Doesn't it seem exciting to learn something that you didn't know before? But have you ever thought about how you learn? You gather information by using your senses. You see, hear, touch, smell, taste. All of those ways of using your body help you learn things, give you clues about things you didn't know before about the world around you. When you talk, you're not gathering any new information. You're only saying what you already know. It is when we listen and pay attention that we learn. You may remember a teacher or a parent saying, listen, they're trying to get your attention so that you'll learn and perhaps understand something. A coach may say, listen up. 
The coach wants you to hear his or her suggestions about what the next play may be. Our Bible story today reminds us of the importance of listening. As we heard, Jesus went up on a mountaintop with Peter, James, and John. While they were there, a cloud came overshadowing them, and a voice came out of heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. The voice was God, urging Peter, James, and John to listen to Jesus. Why do you suppose that happened? Probably because it was important that the three disciples pay attention to what Jesus had to say so that they would learn and eventually understand what he wanted to teach them. In our Bible passage, God's words, listen to him, are followed by this, an exclamation point. When you are reading or looking through a book, have you ever come across that mark? An exclamation point means that what is being said is felt very strongly and is of great importance, almost like a command. Today's story reminds us to take time to listen to parents, teachers, coaches, the world around us, but most especially to God's voice, His Spirit within us. Listen to Jesus. That is the best advice for us today and every day. Please join with me for prayer. Almighty and eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, hear us this morning as we pray to you. We praise you, O oh God, and give you thanks for your manifold blessings and continued mercy toward us. For we live under the watchful eye of your care, and from your bounty we have prospered. When we have sinned, you have spared us. When we have strayed, you have sought us. When we were lost, you have sought us and brought us home. We praise you for the grace and truth that came into this world in Jesus Christ and for the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts. Dear Father, you are the help of your children in every time of need. And today we ask that you would remember, therefore, those among us who are in sickness or sorrow and mercifully deliver them. Look upon those who are perplexed by the troubles of this life and graciously guide them. Hear our prayers for the church, for the sake of your church, O God. Guard your people from evil and danger. Grant us your Holy Spirit that in all our temptations we may be strong. Keep us true to our faith and zealous to proclaim and defend it. Open our minds to your truth, that our errors may be corrected and our hypocrisy purged. Give us faith, hope, and love, and make us to rejoice in the gift of your salvation. And may your peace, which passes all understanding, settle in our hearts and rule our lives this day and forevermore. And hear us again as we pray together as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, 
and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. And then Moses set out with Joshua his aide, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. He said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are here with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went on up the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's good to worship with you this morning. Even though this weekend feels like we really are in the dead of the winter, and even though it is cold outside, I know that we are moving toward a season change. The days are gradually getting longer, and our temperatures will begin the gradual move toward spring. And I'm ready for the spring to come. Even though we have had a relatively mild winter compared to our neighbors to the north, I'm ready for warmer weather and bright sunshine. And while I always look forward to the changing of the seasons, I'm particularly fond of spring. When the grass starts growing and new crops start sprouting, there is a renewed sense of optimism that moves through the, the rural community that I live in. And you don't have to be a farmer or a gardener to be infected by the possibilities that a new spring brings for us. Spring brings new opportunities and a new hope for a better year. Past crop failures are forgotten and new dreams sprout. Farmers are eternal optimists who always believe that a better year is ahead. Bring on the new season and the new opportunities. Of course, I'm not just talking about crops this morning. Spring brings an opportunity for all of us to begin again, to try again. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent a time of reflection that precedes the season of Easter. And for, so for the next six weeks, the Christian church will follow the progression of Jesus' path as he moves toward Calvary. Historically, Lent was a 40-day preparation for baptism or for confirmation at Easter. Youth would go through discipleship classes as they prepared themselves for the next step in their faith development. And adult converts to Christianity went through this same 40-day period of self-examination before they were baptized on Easter Sunday. Of course, over time, we have departed from the traditional pattern of once-a-year baptisms. We celebrate public professions of faith throughout the year, and may have baptisms at any time during the church year. Our practice of observing Lent has evolved from being focused on new Christians who were making an initial profession of faith to being a time when all of us contemplate the meaning of Christ's life and his death. Now there is a part of me that resists this movement toward the cross and the Lenten season. I don't want to be reminded again of our human tendency toward violence and cruelty. 
Of course, I would rather stay in the glow of Christmas and keep celebrating this wonderful light that has come into our world. The Lenten season has a completely different feel about it than the season of Advent. The season of Advent is filled with optimism and hope. Lent is rather dark. We know where it is headed. It is more somber, more contemplative, more reserved. Lent is a season of introspection, a season for reflecting on our relationship with God and noticing those things that hinder our daily walk with God. Lent is a season of learning to say no to those damaging patterns that keep us so frustrated. Now, as a child, all that I knew about Lent was that some people gave up something for the season of Lent. They normally chose things that were not either that were either not too much of a sacrifice or something that they needed to quit doing anyway. But on the other hand, I have to acknowledge that I wasn't raised in churches that valued the church calendar. So Lent wasn't on my radar screen of important times or rituals. But as an adult, I have developed a more appreciative understanding of this season and its potential for being a, a significant time of growth for me and renewal. And it may be that as I've grown older, I've looked for something different in my own spiritual nourishment. When I worship, I'm more attracted to a style of worship that leads me to, to contemplate how my commitment to Christ affects the daily decisions that I make. And so the season of Lent is about retracing the steps of Jesus as he heads toward Jerusalem and the confrontation that will lead to the cross. Lent is also a time for me to pay attention to my own pilgrimage and my own journey of discipleship. So beginning with this coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, we will begin the season of Lent. But we're not here, there just yet. Today is Transfiguration Sunday, the Sunday where churches traditionally read from an Old Testament mountaintop experience and from a gospel reading of the Transfiguration. The Old Testament lesson from Exodus 24 recounts the story of Moses' ascension up, on, up to the mountain to meet God and to receive the law. The mountains for ancient people were the place where you went to meet God. It may, have, may be that they instinctively knew that the sounds of other people could dampen their capacity to hear God's voice. To hear God's voice and to experience God's presence, they needed some distance from the sounds and distractions of other people. I suspect that many of you have discovered that your own personal spirituality is enhanced by your quiet time alone with the Lord. Spending time by yourself is a discipline that takes effort and determination. We live in an extroverted society that values interaction with people at the expense of time by yourself with the Lord. For Moses to discern the laws that would be the fabric of the new society that they were creating, he needed time alone with God. And since in their understanding of the world, God was up there, climbing the mountain put Moses physically closer to God. As I read that text, did you notice in the reading that Moses didn't just ascend the mountain, pick up the two tablets and come back down? No, he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights, listening to God, thinking about the covenant God was making with his people, envisioning this new community 
that God was shaping. One of the critical functions of leadership in a faith community is envisioning the kind of fellowship the group will become. Leadership needs to be asking the question, where are we going? How will we get there? And how will we treat each other on the journey? And while the law of Moses is commonly seen as a series of do's and don'ts in our culture, a list of thou shalt nots, for the early Jewish community, the law was the guidelines that would shape the way they would treat each other. It provided the parameters for the kind of community that they would be. The law provided structure and accountability. For a faith community to flourish, there needs to be a clear understanding of what behavior is acceptable and what steps over the line. We have to be able to trust one another. We need to know what to expect from fellow members of the faith community. And so Moses went up on the mountain and there amidst the clouds and the fire, he saw the Lord's glory. The text doesn't answer many of our questions about what Moses saw. Most mountaintop experiences can't be easily explained, but Moses met God and he was changed by the experience. But this wasn't just about Moses. The mountaintop experience provided the spiritual framework for their developing nation. This Old Testament story of Moses meeting God on the mountain was told and retold as the Jewish people remembered their history. This was the foundation of their moral and legal code. It was the beginning of God's covenant with the people. It may have been that Peter, James, and John could remember this story as they started up the mountain with Jesus. The event of the transfiguration occurs at a pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. As you may remember, the first part of Jesus' ministry was a rural Galilean ministry. He was a traveling teacher and healer who moved between the small towns and villages around the Sea of Galilee. He was generally well received, and he gained a reputation as a rabbi who emphasized a different approach to spirituality. While most of the rabbis focused on the law as the only way to gain God's love, Jesus suggested that God already loved people. And rather than just focusing on the letter of the law, Jesus looked to the spirit of the law for guidance. He asked questions about the original intent of the laws, and he found creative ways to reinterpret the law. His critics suggested that while his teachings were popular out there in the country among the lay people, the scholars in Jerusalem would have a heyday tearing his ideas apart. His emphasis on God's love, well, that would never fly in Jerusalem. And while his opponents were trying to discredit him, Jesus understood what a trip to Jerusalem would mean. He knew that the cross was ahead. And the Gospels used that odd phrase to describe a change of direction in the ministry of Jesus. They say that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He chose a different direction. While he had been just meandering through Galilee, wandering from town to town, now he turns and heads toward Jerusalem. Well, some of his disciples liked the new strategy. They thought that Jesus was ready for the big leagues. He just needed a larger stage where everyone could see his miracles and hear his teaching. But some of his followers had second thoughts about confronting the ruling powers in Jerusalem. And while his disciples 
debated among themselves the, the best strategy for the movement. Jesus struggled to help them understand what this road was ahead. He began saying to them, I'm going to Jerusalem, and when I get there, I will be arrested, beaten, and crucified. And even though Jesus kept repeating the message, it was slow to sink in. Bad news is like that sometimes. We're slow to comprehend what we really don't want to hear. Some of you may remember the time when you heard a doctor's diagnosis that you didn't want to hear. Somehow you just couldn't grasp what the doctor was saying. That's the way it was when the disciples heard Jesus talk about his impending, de his impending death. It was during this pivotal time when Jesus is turning toward Jerusalem and trying to prepare his disciples for the trials that, that was ahead of them that Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain. And there he was transformed right in front of their eyes. I have no idea exactly what happened to him. The word that is trans translated transfigured in the Gospels is the Greek word metamorphosis, or to be changed. The Gospel writer says that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white like light. Now, I don't know what to make of that. I, I do know that this is the traditional language of talking about being in the presence of God. And so the disciples see Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, those Old Testament figures who might represent the law and the prophets. Simon Peter, who is seldom with a loss for words, speaks up. We need to build three booths, three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Perhaps Simon Peter was thinking that Jesus was right up there with Elijah and Moses, and he wanted to honor all three of them. And while he was speaking, a cloud descended over and overshadowed them, and they heard the voice from the cloud. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The same words that thundered from heaven at his baptism are now repeated again. Jesus comes as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is God's son. And so the disciples fall to the ground with fear. The sight and the sounds terrify them. Are you surprised that the disciples respond with fear? You know, these days, people talk about experiencing joy and excitement when they experience the Lord's presence. But in the Bible, fear is the emotion that is most often associated with being in the presence of Almighty God. Jesus had to keep telling his disciples, don't be afraid. So while contemporary believers want to em emphasize the joy that can come from a life of faith, we do well to remember that God's presence in our life can also be downright scary as well as life-changing. The challenges that we face as followers of Christ are not going to be a barrel of laughs or a mountaintop high. As Christians, we discover that a life of faith is filled with danger. We discover that following Christ is hard work. Peter may have wanted to stay up there on the mountain and build some booths, but that's not the way it works. Following Christ meant following him down the mountain and facing the challenges that lay ahead. But I suspect that you have already discovered this truth in your life and in our church. Following Christ is not so much about the emotion that you feel as it is about your faithfulness in doing the things God has called you to do. Following Christ 
is about putting into practice the values that he taught. It's also about doing the hard work of patiently and consistently living out the principles that he taught. Some of you do that when you teach Sunday school on Sunday morning. Others of you provide leadership for our worship service, or you make sure that the sound system works, or you might be involved in leading or participating in the multitude of ministries that are a part of our church. But each of us works out our own ways of living out our faith in Christ. That may seem rather bland or boring compared with the mountaintop experiences, but right here in this place and in this community, we make the choices and do the hard work of taking our faith in God and translating that into practical acts of service and ministry. That is the challenge we face as his followers. May God give us the faith and perseverance needed to meet the challenges of this day and the days of the future. Amen. Now receive this benediction. May the God of the mountaintops and the God of the valleys be your guide as you continue this journey. May you never be outside of God's constant love and care for you. And may you be a blessing to fellow travelers. Go now in peace with the full assuredness of God's grace and God's forgiveness. Amen.